Venerable Thiya Saro, former abbot of Wat Panana Chat, Ubon Ratatani Province, deliver a Dhamma talk on Buddhism for youths. Well, this, this afternoon I thought I'd say a few general words about, about Buddhism and then open it up for, for you to ask questions um, or if you have any, um, you might disagree with what I said and that's all right as well. And this is one of the, indeed that's probably a good place to start because for myself one of the things that really um, interested me and inspired me as a teenager to become interested in Buddhism um, was the um, discovery that Buddhism wasn't um, a belief system like other religions that I that I come across, um, meaning that it didn't expect you or demand you to believe certain things, but it was what I have later come to call an education system. And being an education system, it encourages people to question and doesn't fear or try to escape from doubts. Because if you if you try to um, find happiness through believing in things, um, you can be quite successful in that. I think many people seem to adopt that approach to life. But uh, the problem um, often comes when you meet facts or you meet um, things that don't fit in with your beliefs. And then people can get very um, tense and anxious and defensive or even angry. Whereas in, in Buddhism um, we're encouraged to test the teachings. So it, it's a different way of looking at religious teachings. Not as um, what we call dogmas meaning things that you're told you should believe in this if you want to be a Buddhist, for instance. But the Buddha is giving us tools to use in our education process. And one of the similes, one of the um, ways of talking about this is found in one of the um, old scriptures in which the Buddha says um, if someone wanted to give you or exchange with you some gold and gave you a lump of rock you, you would be foolish just to take his word for it that that is truly gold. Um, what would you do? Well you'd, you'd um, try to perform some tests you'd weigh it wouldn't you? You'd um, um, use a spectrometer or you'd use whatever instruments you had at hand to discover whether that is in fact pure gold. It could just look like gold, it could just be the same color as gold or about the same weight for instance. And so the Buddha said with, with religious teachings it's like that. You don't just um, take anybody's word for it. And, and as I say this was the thing that um, I found quite breathtaking and exciting uh, when I found the Buddha saying look don't believe this even if it's the, the words of the Buddha himself and uh, don't believe something just because a religious teacher or someone in authority um, says uh, that it's it should be that way or it is that way so it seemed to me this was a religion that had uh, gave you a great deal of credit and, and uh, gave you that um, recognition that you have intelligence enough to be able to work things out for yourself. And Buddhism is a religion which has a very strong 
faith in human beings um, rather than looking on human beings as basically um, very weak and um, helpless and needing some supernatural force um, to depend on Buddha said that we can find within us that that energy and that integrity and that um, safety but that doesn't mean you just follow your own opinions and say you know I'm independent and I know what I want and I know what I need because um, the Buddha also points out to us that very often we lie to ourselves or we deceive ourselves or our emotions uh, lead us astray so the Buddha says we have a potential um, in, in us to be truly free and happy um, but that very few people realize that potential because they don't know the right way um, to um, uh, to make it true and real in their daily life so this is what is um, special I think about Buddhism and uh, unique if you like that it has some very clear and precise uh, instructions like a like a manual on how to lead a good life and how to educate the way you live in the world um, educate your emotions educate your thinking educate every single part of your life to reach the optimum level and um, for a Buddhist this is what religion is all about now um, if you were to open a book an um, encyclopedia of religions and there is a definition uh, of what does the word religion mean and there are some like something like ten or more definitions and Buddhism doesn't fit even one of those so you know, what can we conclude from that one thing we can say well uh, that means Buddhism is not really a religion it's something else and many people in the West have that opinion they say oh Buddhism is not really a religion it's it's a science it's a way of life it's a philosophy and, and so on and so forth but another way of looking at, at that is to say well why should people in the West and um, intellectuals in Western countries be the people who decide what a religion is you know what gives them the authority to say my idea of a religion is 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 what a religion really is and Buddhism doesn't fit my idea of what religion is therefore it's not a religion you see um, so um, in the end this is not such an important question but uh, my own view is that it's a different kind of religion and as I say it's a religion which is not a belief system uh, in which you have to believe this, this, this and this and to do this, this and this and not do this, this and this because it says so in a book but it says that in, in um, true religious life we adopt the attitude of a student and being someone who's interested in learning about life and learning about our experience and the main interest here and surely this is true for everyone not just people interested in religion um, is the question of happiness and suffering because everybody in the world whether you you profess a religion or you don't uh, I think we can all say everybody wants to be happy and nobody wants to suffer so if you were to ask an Eskimo that question so would you like to be happy would you like to avoid suffering I think an Eskimo would agree I think someone in in uh, in Africa would agree I think someone in Russia Japan anywhere in the world you were to ask anybody do you like suffering um, I don't think anybody would say yes say do you like to be happy 
We say yes. So the question is, um, why as a, as a species generally, um, given that our, the most important thing in our life that everyone agrees upon is that we want to be happy and we don't want to suffer, why is it that it's so difficult to find anybody who is genuinely happy? And why do we find so much suffering everywhere? In every single country of the world, in every um, strata of society. So it's not only that very poor people suffer, uh, pe middle class people suffer, very rich people suffer. And so I think it, it doesn't take much intelligence to see that your, your income and how much money you have um, is any indication of how happy you are necessarily. Of course, if you have money, um, then it's helpful, isn't it? It means that you um, can live comfortably, and if you are ill, you can get good medical treatment, and so on. So we're not saying that money is not important, um, but merely that perhaps it's not such a powerful um, predictor of happiness as many people believe. So this is, um, again, not a, like a Buddhist belief, you know, Buddhists say money doesn't make you happy. If you're a Buddhist, you have to believe that. But it's saying, does money make you very happy? Um, how happy? How important is it to the experience of happiness in life? Um, what other things are important? Now, if you... <clears throat> so, what we're looking at is the way human beings really are. Now, if you ever have, um, let's say, you got given um, a present, say, uh, for your birthday or on Christmas or some spe uh, special occasion, and it's something that you really, really wanted, um, and it's really important for you to have one of these things. It's a game... Uh, it's a computer or a game or something or other that you really, really wanted and you're really, really happy that you've got it now. Now, what I want you to try to recall is what your experience of happiness with that, uh, with that thing was. You know, in the first day that you got it, I think you were probably very happy and very excited. But how long did that happiness last? Um, how long was that same intensity and real excitement and pleasure um, sustained? I think before very long it just started to fade a little bit. You still enjoyed it, but not quite the same in the same way. And perhaps after a while you just got used to it. And if it was something that you wanted to use um, every day, then maybe uh, use it a little bit less often. Or if it is something that say like a computer that you do use all the time, but your sense of um, joy and um, pride that you're the possessor of this latest model um, computer is, is, not, is not there anymore. Every, everything in the world has that same kind of nature, would you say? And this is what the Buddha wants us to look at. For instance, if you have a particular kind of food that you really love, your favorite food, it's the most delicious thing. Every time you go to a restaurant, this is what you want to eat. And um, let's say that you were able to eat that thing, that favorite food, every single meal, every single day. Uh, for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, day after day after day, you were able to eat your favorite food. What would your experience be? After a while, you get fed up with the sight of it, wouldn't you? Um, I, I, years ago, I remember I was living up in the mountains in Gunchanaburi, and it's a very poor area. And I used to like bamboo shoots, but in that in that area, that was all we used to get given on arms round on Bindabad was bamboo shoot curry, rice and bamboo shoot curry, and a few bananas day after day after day. And uh, this went on for so long that now I can't even look at bamboo shoot curry. Um, and 
This, this is um, a truth of the way human beings are, isn't it? That something, even something that we really like, if we have it too much, we get bored with it. And <clears throat> even people who love each other, if they're, if they uh, are with, with each other all the time, sooner or later they get on each other's nerves. Mm. I once read a, I tell you, it's a kind of horrible thing, but um, you may be... Uh, perhaps interested in this, that in Russia, in the, um, before the communists took over, they were quite cruel also. It wasn't just the communists that were cruel. And they had one horrible way of punishing people, like a man and a wife who were, they thought were um, plotting against the government. What they do was they tie them together back to back, very with rope, and just leave them like that, like for a day or two. And it's, it's so cruel because it's making the body of the person you love the most in the world the thing that tortures you. Just think being bound to somebody else's body by rope, laying on the floor for hour after hour after hour after hour. What a terrible, horrible thing. But this is the way that the nature of the human body can be um, that's a very extreme example I've given you, obviously, but even with the things that we love, they can, under certain conditions and certain circumstances, um, be very unpleasant. Our bodies that we, we use uh, for study, for play, um, very important to us, but our bodies are also the source of a lot of suffering, aren't they? The ordinary, everyday sufferings of uh, being hungry, um, sort of getting thirsty, um, <clears throat> of needing to go to the toilet, all these things you, you, you don't even really think about because they're just so normal and most of you are so fortunate that you've probably never really experienced what hunger's like. you probably never really experienced what thirst is like. But uh, it could happen any time because the body is like this. The body needs constantly to be topped up with food. It needs to be constantly topped up with, with fluid. You can't just leave your body and just say, get on with it. You, know, it has to, you have to look after it all the time. And you can't, uh, you've got to wash it all the time. If you don't have a bath every day, you start to smell. If you don't brush your teeth every day, what would that be like? Mm. You see how much work it is just to keep this body kind of just ticking over in normal shape so it's not... Um, painful to you or uh, or not painful to other people. I mean, some people don't bathe and they don't mind, but it's everybody else who lives with them that suffers. Um, but you so clothes, you see, we, what happens when beautiful, um, expensive fabrics and clothes come into contact with our body? Before very long, they get sweaty and stinky and you have to change them. This is the nature of the body. And when the body gets ill, when you get some kind of illness, then you know just how unpleasant that can be. So this is one of the things as, as Buddhists we're, we're interested in. We're saying, what, what does it really mean? What's it all about to be a human being? You know, what does it mean to have a body? You know, and what's our attitude to our body? This is, you know, many people don't really use their intelligence um, and apply it to their relationship to their own bodies. You know, um, bodies have certain needs, need a certain amount of rest. Um, <clears throat> and if you don't get the right amount of rest, then your body suffers and your, <clears throat> your ability to think and to use your mind well is, <clears throat> is undermined. If you don't eat enough or you eat the wrong kinds of foods, um, your health can suffer. And so Buddhism says this isn't um, something separate from religion. In Buddhism, this is also part of it because if you don't have a, an intelligent, smart relationship to your, to your body, um, you needn't um, doubt that you'll ever be able to really develop anything in the spiritual plane. So, 
This is one of the things, as I say in, in Buddhism, we're, we're interested in, not just um, adopting particular beliefs about things, but developing an attitude of interest in what makes us happy and what makes us suffer. And are there things that always make us suffer or things that just make us suffer sometimes? This is an important um, thing to, to look at as well. For instance, if, if you were to put your hand in the fire, whether you did it in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, um, you'd burn your hand. Um, if, a, uh, if a Christian puts his hand in the fire, his, his hand would burn. A Buddhist, a fully enlightened um, being, um, an atheist, anybody at all, who, at, who matter who they are, um, what their beliefs are, whether they're in a good mood or a bad mood, they put their hand in the fire, they burn their hand, wouldn't they? But why is it that there are other kinds of suffering which are not so fixed? Um, for instance, some people get, uh, get sick and they get very depressed and when they, when they feel a lot of pain and they don't, the medicines are not working and they don't seem to get better and they don't know um, what to do about it and then they can get very depressed but not everybody in that situation gets depressed or not depressed to the same extent so it's obviously a little bit different from if you put your hand in the fire and everybody burns their hand in the same way so on the physical level everyone's put more or less in the same condition but our, our minds um, obviously vary. Some people experience some misfortune in their life um, and they get very unhappy and they feel, that's it, I've got no way, um, uh, my, I'm a mess, I've failed in everything and they get so upset that they sometimes even uh, get mentally ill or sometimes even want to kill themselves. So that's the extent to which the mental suffering can reach um, for some people. And other people seem to be able to bounce back when thing, bad things happen. And they, they have the same kind of unpleasant experiences, but they don't suffer in their mind to the same extent. So this is a truth about human beings, not a religious belief, but it's an observation that we can all make. That um, misfortunes and unpleasant things happen to everybody, but some people seem to deal with it better than others. So why should that be? You know, and is it, uh, is it possible to train yourself in such a way that you're in the group of people that doesn't suffer so much when th bad things happen? Um, someone who can bounce back again. And, <clears throat> and of course what the Buddha says is yes, it, you can. That there's um, certain things that you can um, you can do. It's a very practical teaching. Mm. So, for instance, um, your attitude to things um, is very important, isn't it? If some people uh, feel that bad things happen to them and that means that they're a bad person. And now we can call that um, a very unhealthy way of looking at life but somebody else, the same thing might happen and they might think, well, this is um, a, a teaching, something for me to learn from and, and perhaps if I go through this and come out the other way, I'll be a much stronger and wiser person. So the way your attitude to things and how you understand the meaning of what happens uh, to you in life or what you do is um, a very important thing to pay attention to. Now, um, one of the very practical means and techniques and, and something which is very much emphasized in Buddhism is the ability for, to, to be in the present moment. And you've probably um, heard um, teachings of that of that kind and perhaps in the meditation 
instruction you had a bit earlier on, uh, one of the things you were told to do is to let go of all the thoughts of the past and the future. Now, just being in the present moment um, isn't like the goal. It doesn't mean that everything's all right once you're in the present moment, because um, uh, there may well be no wisdom and intelligence there. Animals, I think, are probably in the present moment most of the time, or all of the time. Um, but as a human being, what we notice is that we waste a lot of time, waste a lot of energy, going over and over and over things that have happened in the past, not for any real benefit to us in the future, but because it's like an addiction, we can't help it. Or else maybe when we get a little bit sad or bored or fed up, then we like to think of some good thing that happened in the past and it cheers us up. So that's one kind of strategy that human beings have to make them feel a bit better in their life. You feel bad and you try to think about something good that happened to you in the past, yeah, you feel a bit better. Um, the other, uh, another way is to have some kind of uh, expectation of the future. When you're feeling unhappy uh, or bored, you can think, well, never mind, tomorrow I'm going uh, I'm going off on a trip here and there, I'll be going to play uh, sport or to going to, to the movies or something like that. So, so this is another um, allied strategy, which means you think about something good that you hope will happen in the future, and that makes you feel better. But thinking about the future has the, the other side, like the dark side, and that means that um, sometimes you just can't stop thinking about things that haven't happened yet that might happen and which you don't want to happen. For instance, you're, you're going to have some kind of examination and you know uh, sitting and worrying about it isn't going to help you get any better results in your exams. It's probably going to make it worse. And what you really need to do is to do the revision and to prepare and you know all that, but you can't help it. Oh, what if I don't pass? What will happen then? And, and this and that. And then if that happened, then this would happen, and that happened, and your mind just goes on and on and on. Um, and you don't want to think like that. You'd, you really just um, would much prefer not to be able to have to think like that, but you don't know how to stop. So what the Buddha is saying is, look, look at your mind and see how out of control it is and how your mind, which we can identify as probably the most important factor in um, producing real happiness in your life, um, is not able to do that um, because we've never trained it and never educated it. So, you know, being smart and being able to do maths and learn foreign languages and, um, and to be creative and to be able to paint and draw and all these things these are certain um, powers and certain gifts um, and things that we can develop to a certain amount through normal education, but they don't touch those parts of our minds which really condition our experience of happiness and suffering at a really basic level. So what the Buddha says is, if you want to be happy in your life, you have to really understand the way your mind works um, and try to um, train it in such a way that it doesn't just keep um, creating all these thoughts and feelings which uh, upset and disturb the mind, but we are able to produce more and more of the positive mental states uh, which make us happy. So it's not kind of something like really mystical and strange and exotic. Um, it's really quite down to earth. And it's something that every one of us um, can do to a certain extent. And it's worth doing, I think. So when we look at our thinking, we begin to see probably about 90% of it um, is probably a waste of time. There's very little um, that you think about in the day which uh, is really useful to your life. Um, so is that true? 
again, this isn't uh, what Buddha Buddha says or what I say. This is something that I want you to look at and see um, whether um, it fits with your own experience. So if you can, if you could let go or abandon and to um, be free of all the useless thinking, one, your mind would feel a lot more spacious, like taking all the furniture out of a room, you've just got more space and airy. And secondly, when you want to think about something in particular, you want to make a plan, you want to um, analyze something, or you want to be creative, then you've got the, the energy and you've got the focus that you can do that much more successfully. So this is the reason why we train our mind to be in the present moment and to see all the thoughts of the past as just that. They're just thoughts of the past and thoughts of the future are thoughts of the future. So sometimes a thought of the past is very useful. You need it if you have some kind of a problem. And one of the things you want to be able to do is just to check. Have I ever had this kind of problem in the past? What did I do? Was I successful? They said, well, last time I did that. Let's try that again and see if that works this time. If it does, well, that's, that's wonderful. Um, so using your experience from the past to help you uh, to solve problems and to, um, and to fulfill your, your responsibilities, your duties in the present is obviously a very um, wise and useful thing to do. Um, <clears throat> And similarly, thinking about the future, we all have to make plans for the future. And we've all come here today because uh, you made an agreement to come um, in advance. You said, um, and I've come here because I made a, um, a plans months before to come. So it's not that we can't think about the future at all. But when we want to um, think about the past or about the future, uh, we know it's just that, it's thoughts of the past and thoughts of the future, and then we, we make use of them. And <clears throat> so what we need to have to help us to be able to do this is we, we have a certain um, object, um, let's say the breath or a particular word, um, and we say we'll use that as our anchor. And so we bring our mind back to that, and then when it wanders off, we realize and we bring it back and it wanders off and we bring it back. So this is a training like, like you train a, a wild elephant. And one of the, one of the um, ways they have of, of training a wild elephant, um, I'm not sure in Thailand, in, in, in India, they, they start off with the baby elephant and then they, they um, <coughs> attach a rope to one of its legs and then the other rope to a, a post which is firmly embedded in the earth. And so the, uh, the baby elephant, he tries, obviously he wants to be free and he pulls and pulls and pulls at the stake. But then he, uh, he realizes after a while that no matter how hard he pulls, he can't get free. And after a certain while he just gets used to um, being attached to that post and stops running about here and there. Now the interesting thing is that after a while the, the person who's training the elephant um, can untie the rope from the, the stake but because the, the elephant has that rope around his leg he still feels as if he's tied to the stake and he, he won't run off anywhere. And this, this is... Um, and if, a, if an elephant starts to um, misbehave, the elephants that have been trained this way, all they have to do is just to get close and tie a rope around the elephant's leg. They don't have to do anything more than that. And then the elephant calms down. So this is um, somewhat similar to, to when we train our minds. We start off and you have this stake, and, um, which I compared with an anchor or a stake, something embedded in the earth that doesn't move. And you just keep coming back to that again and again until your mind um, is happy and willing to do that 
and it doesn't try to wander off and think about that and think about this when it's not appropriate to do so. And then after a certain while, um, your mind finds it's very pleasant um, to be like that. It's, it makes you happy not to be uh, have your mind rushing all over the other place, up and down, round and round, but to have a certain stability and evenness of your mind. And then you don't, <coughs> in, your, in your daily life, you, it's not that you have to be uh, obviously uh, watching your breath every, every moment, but just like the elephant with the, with the string or the rope around his, his leg, is you start to develop that ability to be in the present moment more and more. Now that's not the end of the story, uh, it's the beginning if you like, because when you can be in the present moment, then you can learn from what's happening. And you can see, oh yes, that's interesting, oh that's, that's, uh, and what you begin to notice and, and um, very soon is um, this, what we call the law of kamma, which is that good intentions have good results and bad intentions have bad results. And so again, if you just read that in a book, it's like, oh, this is a Buddhist teaching. Buddhism teaches karma uh, or kamma. But what we're doing when we learn to be in the present moment is we begin to see for ourselves how our minds work and how certain ways of thinking uh, lead to certain ways of acting um, and they make us happy and make other people happy, certain ways of thinking, um, certain ways of looking at things, certain intentions um, lead to unwholesome kinds of emotions and actions and speech which causes distress and suffering for ourselves and others. So we begin to see how this actually works in ourselves, not just in a, in a book. So this is um, what Buddhism says, Buddhism says it's not just a matter of reading things and memorizing things. You know, in the uh, education system in this country for a long time, the children would just um, be taught to memorize all these lists. What are the Four Noble Truths? What are the Eightfold Paths? And that means you studied Buddhism because you can remember these words. Um, but of course you remember them then before very long you forget them. Um, so that's not really the point about uh, memorizing uh, lists of, of terms, but it's more having this attitude of interest in learning from life uh, with that faith in your ability as a human being to free yourself from pain and suffering, um, to develop inner peace and happiness, um, and to lead your life with wisdom rather than just to uh, follow um, desires and, and prejudices and, um, and so on. And this is what Buddhism is, says religion is about. It's, it's how to lead the good life or the best life using the tools that you have. It's not about believing in things, praying for things, asking for things, depending on things outside of yourself, but it's developing the tools and the ability to become a refuge to yourself. And the Buddha says the more that you take on this interest, this attitude, this kind of training and education, um, not only is um, your ability to make yourself happy and peaceful much enhanced, but also it has a good um, effect on the people around you. Of course, if you are more sensitive to others, how your behavior affects other people, um, you're kind and generous, um, and so on, then everyone around you, I think, is going to like that and to feel better as a result. So the idea is that the more you help yourself in the right way, the more you help others, and the more you help others in the right way, the more you help yourself. Okay, so that's um, the, the talk that I, I wanted to give you this afternoon. And um, now we can uh, have some discussion, if you like. Does anybody, would you like to get up and stretch your legs for five minutes first? Or are you? Okay, we'll have a short break for five minutes, okay? okay.